This text is massively relevant. It's, it's a text like no other text in the Bible. There's not another text that lays out the steps from God to salvation the way this one does in verses 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, which is what we're going to focus on. Remember the problem that Paul is dealing with now so that we get oriented. The issue is, in chapters 9 and 10, why is it that Israel, the chosen people, are not participating in the great salvation, the true Israel, and the answer is election, and the answer is unbelief? In this text, from verses 14 to 21, the answer is because they don't believe. You see it in verse 16, who has believed our report? And you see it in verse 21, I hold out my arms all day long to an unbelieving, hardened people. So the reason Israel is not participating as a whole in the new or true Israel is because they're pushing the Messiah away and they're not putting their faith in him. The main point of the verses, therefore, is simply the unbelief of Israel as an answer to the question, why are they not in the fold? But inside that bigger main point... Paul is addressing, I think, an objection in verses 14 15. And the objection probably went something like this. Well, you say the problem is that Israel's not believing. But maybe God hasn't put in place the prerequisites that will enable them to be held accountable for believing. And that's why these five stages or steps are important. I think the point of verses 14 to 17 is all the stages are accounted for and all of them are in place for Israel. And therefore that objection does not hold. I think that's what's going on behind these five steps. Let's read them. Verse 14. He's just said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now he says, but how are they to call on him? in whom they've not believed. He's working backwards here just just to point out what the steps are that need to be in place. How are they to call on him whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him, step two, whom they've not never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone is preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? And then he quotes Isaiah 52, 7. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Verse 16, but in spite of the fact that people with beautiful feet have been sent and all the pieces are in place for Israel, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, and it's very significant that he chooses a phrase from Isaiah 53, verse 1, the most clearly Jesus-exalting messianic chapter in the Old Testament. He bears our sins, and by his wounds we are healed. And the doctrine of justification is more explicitly in Isaiah 53 than any other chapter in the Old Testament. There's no no accident that Paul reaches for that chapter to say, Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? In other words, Isaiah is throwing up his hands and saying, my ministry is, is not bearing any fruit. And God had appointed him to bear no fruit. Remember the calling in chapter 1? No, chapter 6. Here I am, I'll go. What do you want me to say? Say, make the heart of this people fat. In other words, God was using Isaiah as a judgment on Israel. Poor Isaiah, you know. Some pastors have to to go that route. There are churches that will not change. And I grieve the pastors I deal with over the telephone. and, And I just ache for pastors who, I think, owing to no fault of their own, hit a wall in ministry that just won't budge. And I think they need to hear, kind of echoing in the background, go make the heart of this people fat. Because I don't intend to rescue that church. I mean, when a church passes a certain line, or an individual passes a certain line, God may just walk away from them. And I thank God that you are such an amazingly humble and yielded people to the Word of God. I just sense that every time I get close to what the Word is really saying, you get close to saying, Amen, which makes a really happy life together. 
Verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The reason Paul, I think, quotes in verse 15 this Isaiah 52, 7 phrase, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news, are, is twofold, twofold reason. Here's the first one. I think he wants to say to us, people who bring good news... Gospel news, news of the cross, news of the resurrection, news of the kingdom saying your God reigns are precious people. And one of the ways you express your sense of preciousness towards someone is saying that they're beautiful when they're not. I've never seen a beautiful foot in my life. No matter how hard women try to paint them. Feet aren't beautiful. So what does it mean when it says, how beautiful are the feet of good news bringers? It means, it means good news bringers are so precious you want to bow down and kiss their feet. People who bring good news to you that might save you from hell that might rescue you from your sin, that might mend your marriage, that might heal your body, that might give you everlasting joy, you're tempted to bow down and kiss their feet. There was a Vietnam veteran, and a guy whispered his name to me as I was coming in. Reeves, Reeves, the guy who got his face blown away, and he goes around and he speaks and has a ministry to young people. And I remember reading that when he came back from Vietnam, his wife hadn't seen him. He was a handsome guy. He'd gone out, and now he's, he's just a he's just face is blown away. And he's lying there in the hospital, and he's wondering, will she want to be married to me anymore? And she walks in and looks down and says, you're beautiful. Now, what did that mean? That meant, you are so precious to me. I see beauty when I look at you. This text, oh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, tells us something about beauty. (laughs) I had to resist, and I do resist now, going into a sermon on beauty and women, and beauty, handsomeness, and men. Because there are a lot of women, probably some in this church, who spend a lot of time on their hair and a lot of time on their eyes and a lot of time on their lips, and a lot of time on their clothes, and their feet, and don't spend any time on becoming beautiful. Which is very sad. This is a text about what makes a person beautiful. And what makes a person beautiful, what makes feet beautiful is leathery, scarred, dirty, gnarled, trekking into places where the gospel wouldn't otherwise get, whether it's across the street, the fence, or the world. That's beauty. Beauty is measured by the extension of mercy in a life. Paul Brand was a missionary to India, a medical missionary, He wrote an article in Christianity Today a few years ago that I cut out, put in my files. I hardly have to read it. I almost memorized the article, at least the main points of it. It was so moving to me. He he went back from India. His mother was a missionary. And he went back, got his medical training, I think, in in Britain. And then he went to uh, India again. And his mother was about 70 or so. And he hadn't seen her for a long time. And he he was just stunned at how she'd aged. And he said, Mother, you're... You've aged so much. I've never seen such deep wrinkles. She took all the mirrors out of her little house. And for the next 20 years, she ministered until she died in her early 90s and never had a mirror in her house in those 20 years. And when she died... Hundreds of villages from all over the mountains of that part of India came and buried with great celebration, a beautiful woman. And there are many of you like that who understand that too. 
The second reason I think he uses uh, Isaiah 52, 7 is simply to say that all the pieces are in place. In other words, there has to be calling and there has to be believing and there has to be hearing and there has to be preaching and there has to be sending. And then he says, as it is written, these feet are beautiful. I've sent them. And so the, 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 the pieces are in place and Israel is responsible.